Amen. Of course, the Sadducees kick in. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe the word of God. They don't believe that there's angels. They don't believe there's such thing as miracles. They don't believe there's life after the death. These are the, the secular humanist, the, the progressive liberal Adventists, if you, if you will. They don't believe the Bible. Yes, they believe this and they believe that. But, you know, don't get too... Don't get too bent out of shape about it. You know, we're just, you know, be friendly with the world and all that other stuff. So the, the Sadducees are the Sadducees are really the king of the South. They're the, the, the secular humanist, the atheistic philosophies or the humanist philosophy people that, you know, they're they're religious. But, you know, let's not get too extreme about this. You know, uh, you know, don't get too fanatical. So you see that you see the, the 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 king of the North, which is the Pharisees, you know, the religious religious zealots and then you see the sadducees which are the the king of the south you see both groups and both of them come together they coalesce to attack to attack christ so the pharisees and sadducees hate each other and they're always fighting each other but when it comes to jesus comes to the temple and proclaims himself as the lord of the temple then they both coalesce together to fight against him and that's 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 prophecy right there and by the way that's what we're seeing take place in our world also, we're seeing it in our church. And ultimately, they cooperate with Rome to put them to death. That's right. Which is what Jesus is going to be describing, right? Of course, then you get to the, the, the very last thing that Jesus says to them. is that He asks them a question about the, uh, the son of David. Who is he? Whose son is he? And uh, then he quotes Psalm 110, which is which is amazing to me. This is a coronation psalm, obviously. Um, and then he tells them, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And then he asks them a question. Well, David calls him Lord. How can he be his son? And they, they have no answer. Um, and that's mm -hmm. actually a, a neat study right there, that whole question. Um, but anyways, the fact that they have no answer is that because they're, they're not understanding who Jesus is and they're not understanding who the Lord is and they're not understanding his position of authority and what God is trying to do. It kind of mm -hmm. goes back to the same thing that we talked about with uh, the image on the coin. And then, of course, you get into Matthew 23. And then these are this is when Jesus painfully describes to the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law their true condition. Um, the, the question about David's son, that's the question that leads them to stop asking any more questions. That's right. They stop trying to trick him after that. They realize, you know, we just can't even handle what he's saying to us. That's right. And so what's interesting is that he points them to, to the whole Messiah question of the kingship of the Messiah. Exactly. By the way, this is what's going to happen this whole week. Um, remember when he goes to trial and they're all frustrated because they can't find enough false witnesses to come up with, to come up with accusations to kill him. They, then they ask him the question, well, whose son, you know, what's your relationship to the father? And then Jesus actually quotes Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he combines the two together, right? He says, you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power, seated on the, cl seated on the clouds of the right hand of power, right? And he knows as soon as he tells them that he's the king, that he's the Messiah, he knows what's going to happen. They're going to kill him, right? Of course, Mrs. White is clear in triumphal entry. He knows when he presents himself to the people as the king that they're going to crucify him. So, anyways, the woes to the Pharisees are... They really cuts to the heart. If you're honest with your, if we, if we're honest with ourselves when we read it, it nails us, because it nails our, our deny, recreating, and performing our ideas of wanting to be accepted. We we definitely want to be accepted by people. We want to look good. We want to sound good. We want to be smart. But the truth is, we know inside all of us, we're wretched and we're miserable and we're poor. We're blind. We're naked. We need the righteousness of Christ. We have no righteousness on our own. So who's, why are we playing this religion game? Why are we convincing ourselves we're better than other people or, or all this foolishness that we do, right? That religious people do. And so the woes of Christ really nail all of us. And, uh, we're supposed to see ourselves and see our need for him. And sadly enough, they don't, these people, they don't see their need for Christ. And that's, that's just so sad. And of course you can hear woe in the Bible is 
it's it's kind of like it's Jesus is lamenting. Oh, and you see it in verse thirty-seven when he says, "Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem." It, by the way, Mrs. White is very clear. That there was tears running down his face as he's as he's sharing these woes. He, there's no Jesus is not happy about telling people their true condition and 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 literally undressing them in front of the mob, the multitude. He's not. He doesn't look forward to this, but he. But he tells them that he has to tell them the truth. Ezekiel talks about those who receive the mark and the report of those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are in 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 Israel and Jerusalem, right? In Israel, and this is these woes are literally Jesus is sighing and crying over the lost the, the losses. I mean, Jesus came to save these people, and they're rejecting him. So his his heart is breaking. So it's he is literally sighing and crying. That's what the woes are. And that's where he says, in, again, in thir verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather you, gather your ch children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. And then he's, he has to give them over to what they're choosing. He says, behold, your house has left you desolate. For I, sh I say, you shall not see me. You shall see me no more to you. Say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, you know, this is, this is it. Jesus has given them over to their choice. And, of course, this is, this is actually the abomination of desolation. As he's saying, their house is left to them desolate. Now, of course, this is the, the problem is the disciples don't realize what's happening here, right? They don't realize that the abomination of desolation has just taken place. So this is what's going to be the setting for Matthew 24, one of the things he has to do is he has to challenge the authority of the of the religious teachers to the mob to the multitude, so that they will look to Christ as a source of salvation and stop trusting the religious leaders as as a source of their salvation, as a source of truth. Uh, even up to this time, many of the disciples still still look to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the structure of the church organization and the leaders and the administrators as 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 a source of truth. And Jesus Jesus is is not one stone is gonna be left on another, right? There is no salvation in church structure. Nobody else is a source of truth. They don't what they know, if they have truth, it only comes from God, right? So this what Jesus is literally tearing down anything that will stand in the way of any of anyone seeing him as the sole source of salvation the sole source of truth and and religious people we we build these structures around us and our churches we tend to have these structures and we tend to believe or think that somehow there's there's something in of, of inherent righteousness in it or something i mean you know we're, we've lost our minds but so Jesus is, is present, he, he's presenting himself as a sole source of truth. And if he's a sole source of truth, then there is no...